So something I don't usually talk about was I was actually a minor in English for my post-secondary education. And I don't talk about it that much, uh, a little bit because I'm embarrassed by it. Because, not because of the content area, but because of the way that I actually got that minor. I actually did not love reading as a child. But what I learned is that I could read parts of a book and when I had to write an essay, I could connect it to my life. I could do something and I could kind of figure out a way to game the system, to figure out how to do school. And I did it enough that I would pass and my parents wouldn't be upset with me, but I didn't really achieve anything great. And I actually figured out uh, that I could do it really well in high school. So why not continue it into uh, post-secondary so I continued, you know, exploring uh, English, not because I was passionate about it, but because I figured this is a way to get a degree. And I saw school as a checklist, as an endpoint to get to something uh, for the next phase of my life. And I thought about this as I was talking to Ellen Linehan, and she's actually the author of an upcoming book called Capturing the Classroom. And we had a really great conversation because she's a uh, current English teacher and talked about like, what would you do with a student like me? Someone who maybe doesn't have that passion, how do you bring that out in them? So we talked about that. We talked about how video can really uh, be utilized in the classroom uh, as a teacher to not just be the sage on the stage, but also be the guide on the side at the exact same time. And as I shared in Innovator's Mindset, it's not about being one or the other. It's about being what you need in the moment and how we play so many different roles in education. I, I really enjoyed the conversation with Ellen. She seems like an awesome teacher. Great conversation. I hope you enjoy it. Welcome to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. And one of the things I love about doing this podcast is I often get to connect with people I don't really know and haven't met. And Ellen and I connected um, and we've we've kind of passed each other, you know, in certain conferences, but I've been able to kind of just sit and have conversations with her. And I'm excited to kind of dig deeper. And it's kind of like you're going to I'm going to get to know Ellen the same way you do. Um, over this time. Now we have some mutual friends. Mike Mohammed is uh, someone you, you work in the same school district as him. And he's someone who was recently on the podcast. And so mm -hmm. I'm going to, I'm going to do some research on you after make sure, you know, like he's uh, Mike Mohammed and I go way back. So he, he probably knows you really well, but just yeah. a little bit about uh, Ellen. She's uh, currently an English teacher um, in, in, is it Elm? Sorry. It's Elmbrook schools, but with yeah. Brook, Brookfield. Brookfield Central. Brookfield mm -hmm. Central, right? So that two, so many Brooks going on there, right? And so then you, so <laughs> you teach English and we were talking a little bit about, the, about, you know, some of my experiences, you know, as a student in English class. And I'm going to ask you about some of your kind of philosophy and things like that. But you also have a book coming out right away called Capturing the Classroom. And I'm excited yeah. for that. Just kind of hearing some of the, just kind of the little tidbits that you told me about it. It seems like it, it was a book that was, pretty visionary at the time, but now is seemingly, you know, standard uh, for the work that we're doing during COVID pandemic, all that other stuff. So Ellen, thank you so much for being on the podcast and, you know, taking this time to just kind of sit and have a conversation with me, but can you just tell people a little bit about yourself and, and your educational journey and, and how you got to do what you're doing today? Of course. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, so my educational journey, well, I grew up in Wisconsin, so I, I'm I'm pretty proud of the public schools here. Mm -hmm. I feel like I've got a really good foundation. Um, I went to University of Wisconsin Madison, uh, got a degree in English and history. And this was a pre internet. So I graduated from college in 1990. And so um, there weren't really obvious options for a, a career path in English and history. <laughs> so right. I quickly found myself back in grad school. Uh, I was married and living down in Tennessee, so I went to Austin P. State University in Clarksville, Tennessee, and got my uh, master's in English and a master's in education at the same time, actually, hmm. and just wound up in this teaching path, which I hadn't really planned, but um, honestly, I, I just, I, I believe that there is a bigger plan for my life, and so um, I'm really excited about how, how it developed. Uh, so I taught a couple of years in Department of Defense high schools and then ended up 
um, freelance writing for about 10 years when my kids were little. Mm -hmm. And now I've been back at, um, since we relocated to Wisconsin, I've been back here in the Elmbrook School District. This is my 17th year. And that, that's, that, that's actually interesting. So I, I, this is, I don't think a lot of people know this about me, but I actually have a minor in English um, through my uh, university. That's like, I have a bachelor of like social sciences and, and, and this is going to be horrible. I'm like curious of what you're going to think about this. So I can tell you straight up, I have a bachelor of English, but I never read any of the novels uh, from front to back the entire time I was in university, not one. I actually remember I did a Shakespeare. <laughs> oh no, I think I, I feel like I'm in trouble already. I feel like I'm getting in trouble from an English teacher already. So the, the, so I remember distinctly, we ha I had to take a, like a Shakespeare class and it was like, a, it was like you had to take it. And it was very hard for me to read. It was very hard for me to read and I couldn't make it through any book. And so I didn't read the stories, didn't read any of the stuff that, so like we had that big anthology, like basically everything Shakespeare. And so I, for the final, I'm not even kidding. I went to a video store. I rented every Shakespeare thing I could get my hands on and watched it for 24 hours. So I watched, I remember like 12 movies or 12 things about Shakespeare and like barely passed the test. But I, what I learned and figured out really early is that I could just read parts of books. And then when I had to write my essay, I would just pick that part out and like make something sympathetic to my life. And I could sucker the teacher. And I'm like, I'm going to do, I learned that in high school. I'm like, I'm going to do this in university. And so like, it's like, oh, I, I, I know this is weird, but I did not like reading. Um, I did not like reading when I walked out of high school. And, but I figured out like, Hey, I can actually kind of game the system and get a degree in this stuff, but I don't really necessarily have to read. And like, I love writing, but it, it really didn't, I wrote in college and high school to get a grade. I didn't really start writing for joy and to share my thoughts until I was older. Cause I didn't think that was even a, an opportunity for me. I felt, felt writing was just to get grades. Right. So like, how do you deal with a kid? <laughs> I feel like, I oh. feel like this is like, a, I'm like, a, like, I'm in like a English history teacher's confet or English teacher's confession class now. <laughs> right? Well, like I, okay. or maybe my, like my high school degree is going to be rescinded. <laughs> <laughs> well, we won't go that far. Yeah. No. Um, so many thoughts, so many thoughts. Good, First good. of all, Shakespeare's hear. supposed to be watched, not read. That was the whole point. Exactly. So good for you. Exactly. Right. That's exactly. what you should do. Exactly. Um, Thank you. And for kids not reading, um, I am probably one of the few English teachers that really hardcore believes I'm not going to assign anything to read outside of my classroom, and I'm reading it. So today, we read a chapter of okay. a separate piece. They listen to me read it. Tomorrow, we'll talk about it. We'll have a discussion, and then we'll read chapter two. And from high to low kids benefit from hearing someone read to them. Now they've got the text in front of them, they're reading along, but they, I am not going to discuss literature with people who haven't read the book. It's my firm, right. I'm, like you wouldn't talk about a movie with somebody who hadn't seen right. it. Totally. So I know that they've read the book because they sat physically with me and they read the book. So that kind of gets around that a little right. bit. Um, as for reading Shakespeare, we do read it out loud in class, but they take a part and I'm helping them to understand and mm -hmm. we're stopping and we're talking about it. Um, I think that the, probably one of the greatest disservices that a teacher can do is to give somebody a Shakespeare play and say, go read this, mm -hmm. make sense of it. Right. It's kind of like reading a foreign language. If you don't have any context right. or skills, how are you supposed to do that? And so what happens? They hate it. They hate Shakespeare, mm -hmm. um, they which do. to me is just, <laughs> ah, right? right like, right, no, right. I, I would rather that they don't even touch it. Just right. leave Shakespeare alone if you're not going to mm -hmm. inspire love for it. Um, so that that's kind of my thought on it. And um, I get them super pumped up. I'm like, oh, did I mention next week we're doing Shakespeare? Like, we're done. And we're going to be done with the right. research part. Right. And then we're going to get into Shakespeare. And that's going to be so much fun. And they're like, who is this wackadoodle right. talking about Shakespeare like <laughs> Yeah. I, I hype it big time before we get there. Well, th th that's like, so when I, when I'm thinking about that, like when I look at, if you give me like the summaries of like any Shakespeare mm -hmm. play, right. 
And you, mm-hmm. you really like, I'm like, oh, that's a really powerful lesson. Like that's a really powerful story. Right. But to mm-hmm. kind of like filter through it, I had a really hard time. And I think I struggle with that and just kind of understanding that. And, um, I still struggle with this. And this was, you know, I, I so I was thinking about, did my high school English teachers read to me? And I was thinking about that. And I, is that, can I ask you just quickly, is that a norm for a high school English teacher? No. Okay. So, so I was like, oh, that that's not normal. And then I'm like, oh no, our high school English teacher did read to us. And yeah, and I can tell you, I can tell you why I remember this. So uh, our high, my one high school English teacher, his name was Herman Bauer and the nicest man. Um, and uh, I knew his daughter, his daughter graduated with me, just the nicest family ever. And he read The Great Gatsby and I knew he was going to read The Great Gatsby to us in grade three, even though I, that wasn't going to be until grade 11. And the reason I knew it is because I had two older brothers who used to do an impression of Herman Bauer reading The Great Gatsby and they would go daisy, daisy, daisy. And I remember this. And, and so like, I was like, I want, and so like, no offense. I wonder if some kids have an impression of how you read. Right. Cause like, I knew this right. years prior that Herman mm-hmm. Bauer was going to read the great Gatsby to us in grade 11, because my brothers right. would do this impression. And it was like, everyone had a Herman Bauer impression. And it was like, not right. a, like a mean thing. It was like out of like, we just loved that man. We loved him. And it was mm-hmm. kind of an interesting thing. But I, I also like, this is one thing. And I, I, I love your thoughts on this too. I was actively discouraged by, by some of my English teachers when I was in high school um, that like, for example, I, I always reference this Rick Riley. He wrote, um, he writes mm-hmm. the back article of sports illustrated for yeah. like, for the yeah. longest time. And I used yeah, to go awesome. into the library, go right, find that article, read that article. And I was constantly told like, you can't bring that in class. It's not real reading. It's a magazine. And if you look okay. at probably the biggest influence in the way that I write today, cause I tell a lot of stories in the writing, it is that one page article that I used to read from Rick Riley. Right. But I was right. like discouraged from it because it wasn't academic enough. It wasn't like mm-hmm. full book, but it was like, kind of like, it was kind of like, you know, he wrote these one page stories, which I kind of are kind of like my blog post now, which kind of led mm-hmm. to my books. He's written books. Do you know what I mean? But yeah. that yeah, to me yeah. was like the most, that's what I loved. That's what I loved. But I, but I never got exposure to that in an English class only on my own time. And like, I wonder wow. how you deal with that, how you see that yeah. story. I'm actually doing Rick Riley and AP Lang tomorrow. Really? No joke. Yep. Um, yeah. You know, that's the push with um, yeah. nonfiction reading. We really want them to read things that are not just fiction yeah. um, to be yeah. able to, you know, read for the, for the message, for the clarity. Um, so yeah, that's Rick Riley. Some of my favorite stuff. The hate mail from cheerleaders collection yeah. is just um, great stuff. Well, the only, and the only non read for meaning. Sorry. The, o- the only nonfiction I swear that I, re- I cannot remember one nonfiction thing I read K-12 mm-hmm. other than textbooks. Do you know what I mean? Like, I wow. right. And so yeah. I like, you know, and that, and so I, I hated reading, walking out of school because I just mm-hmm. uh, equivalent or, you know, reading for me was fiction. I, I, and I'm again, I'm like, I shouldn't need, I like feel guilty for having this conversation, but I hate fiction to this day. I do not like reading mm-hmm. fiction, but I love reading. I love reading nonfiction. Yeah. I, and I find like, if a story is true, I'm much more invested into it than like, mm-hmm. I'm not interested in Harry Potter and stuff like that. And I have no issue with mm-hmm. anyone who, who loves that stuff. Oh, geez. <laughs> right. Yeah, I know. I know. I like, I feel super guilty. I've said this in front of like a group of okay. English teachers and it's just like darts, like just throwing darts. No. At me. It's like, but, yeah, but yeah. I love, no, like, my, I love, my husband love won't read fiction either. Yeah. So, yeah. and it's, you know, I know I, 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 you know, but like, but a lot, I wouldn't say like, oh, you don't read nonfiction. Like you're you mm-hmm. like, it's just like, Hey, you like what you like. And so like, can we help right. kids get into that? So I don't know. So like, like in your, so like in an English class, like you said, mm-hmm. you, d- what else do you read? That's like nonfiction. Like, like, uh, well, actually for my, the class that I'm teaching right now, they do something called round table discussions. Mm-hmm. So, um, they're in small groups and they kind of take turns, but somebody each week, sometimes more than one person in a group will have, um, some kind of an article that they bring in that's on a hot topic. And so it's kind of leading towards a research mm-hmm. project where they may decide to write about that particular topic, but it's just to get them started. And so they're, I mean, the, the current topic events, I mean, this year has been full of them. Um, 
and it's really interesting to hear their discussions mm -hmm. um, where somebody has to actually introduce the article, talk about what it's about, kind of give a summary of it, and then lead a discussion on, you know, what do you think of that? What do you right. think about, um, you know, all the, the different social initiatives that have been happening in the world? Um, it's been really fascinating. Mm -hmm. So they're bringing the materials to the class and keeping it kind of fresh. Every every term is something different because the topics, the hot topics are changing yeah. daily. So so how do you how do you how do you like encourage like disagreement? Because I know a lot of the topics that you know, there's there's seems like a lot of conversations are like you either 100% agree or mm -hmm. we we're not listening, right? I, I feel yeah. like yeah, like are we? I, you know, how, I tell my kids you, all the time, that? like, you've got the state of the art piece of of technology in your hand all mm -hmm. the time, mm -hmm. and so to just take somebody's word for something without mm -hmm. challenging it, um, you know, I always compare it to having a conversation in the lunchroom in the 1980s. You know, like, well, did you hear that? Well, duh. Like, you just take it for right. whoever's right. telling you that because right. who's going to go look it up to know for right. sure. Um, but now I, I tell them, challenge them all the time. Like Google it, see what you find. Mm -hmm. Don't just agree because that's what your friend says. Um, bring in, and so when they choose their topics for debate, uh, a lot of times they'll choose them in opposition, like something really mm -hmm. fired them up, but that somebody else brought in as a topic and then they'll take the opposite side, uh, to present it that way. So I really try to encourage some good discourse, um, that they're, they're not just taking it. They're asking challenging questions. They're not just taking what, even if they totally agree, they mm -hmm. still need to challenge, like, where did you find that information? Or what's that based on? And what's the study for that? Um, what's your source on that? Because a lot of times there's a lot of, um, especially in politics, I think people kind of just jump on bandwagon with what their friends are saying mm -hmm. or whatever, what their parents are saying, maybe, or the opposite of what their parents are saying. <laughs> totally uh, instead totally. of <laughs> Right. Instead of really kind of doing some fact checking of their own. Um, so this has gotten them kind of out of their their normal zone of I just go along with what everybody else is saying. Well, so. the, there, There is something to be said with um, the I can't remember the show. It was like massive when it first came out. And I'm sure it was like uh, so, the social something It was on Netflix. The social dilemma, I think it was called. And it talked okay. about like basically the, one of the terms they use was the, the attention economy, right? Like so many social networks are like trying to get everyone's attention. So for example, mm -hmm. something that, you know, uh, Instagram stories, right? So Instagram stories, right. uh, they only are there for 24 hours. And the reason they're there for 24 hours is because they, cr they try to create a need in people to constantly check them because if I don't check it, I'm going to miss what happened. Right. And so, right. you know, like you have clickbait titles, you have like these things and, and, I, I, I have really, 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 really tried to just slow, not like rush to judgments, uh, just try to like find my own information. I, I will say this too. I've had a lot of times where I've posted like a quote, um, from an article that I wrote myself. Okay. So I know mm -hmm. it inside out mm -hmm. and there's something. Right. And then someone on Twitter, who's an educator will say like, Oh, that's like dumb, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, did you read the link? Did you read what I wrote? And sometimes they'll say exactly what I said in the article and they'll be arguing against my tweet because they didn't read the link. They just saw the the snippet and they were bothered by this. And I think it's a really important skill that like even, and I've been, I'm sure I've been guilty of this as well as like seeing an, like the title, but not digging deeper and then making a quick judgment or, you know, making an mm -hmm. assumption about something saying like, Hey, like, in a time where there's so much information that's being thrown at us so quickly, we need to actually teach ourselves to slow down. And, and I don't know right. if you're seeing that or yeah. if, is that like, yeah. do you see that yeah. as something with your students yeah. or like, I, I call that marinating. You yeah. need some time to marinate. Yeah. Don't, don't be quick. So quick to throw the, the meat on the grill. You got to let it marinate first. You got to mm -hmm. actually um, think about it. You got to take in the information and make sure you really understand what it is and then do a little fact checking. Mm -hmm. Um, I think with social media, especially like the, the, the reaction for people to just quickly post or comment, right. um, right. you know, very few people feel in the long run, like, I'm really glad I posted that comment. <laughs> Most of the time, right? <laughs> it's like, oh, oh I wish I would have like, you know, 
Like I didn't know that was a big scam when I posted right. or when I shared it. I'm like, mm, probably um, take some time and and just don't have a quick rush to judgment. <laughs> um. <laughs> I, you you would hope they feel that. Do you know what I mean? Like if they don't, that's probably not the best sign either. Right, right. You right. know, and I think the best of us get caught in that trap sometimes. Mm -hmm. But um, for the most part, I try not to not to to react or like or share. Um, unless I'm really fully invested and know what I'm, what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah. Like, and if you're willing you know? to get willing to kind of like get into the conversation and things like that, there, mm -hmm. there's actually, um, this is something I'm really proud of. So today, um, I had, like, I posted something and I had two people, um, like asking me questions like, Hey, well, I like this, but like, have you ever thought about blah, blah, blah? I said, yeah, I have. And then I just showed a link to a longer article with like, well, like very thought out ideas. And it was mm -hmm. just like, all I had to do was like Google my name with like some keywords. And I found that stuff. And I, I, I like, I feel that I've been writing for, um, in my blog for like 11 years and mm -hmm. I have like an answer to everything that I'm asked educationally that I could just Google and yeah. say like, Hey, here's some things that I think about this. And like, sometimes I, like one of the things, and it's interesting you say that about how people like kind of regret some of their comments. Uh, mm -hmm. I remember years ago, I wrote a blog post about like, basically if you're not on Twitter, like you're becoming irrelevant, like you're a bad teacher, like nobody wants you in education anymore. It was like, it wasn't that harsh, but it was pretty close. <laughs> Like it, I felt like when I read it, I like, oh, that's like gross. I, I, I literally took that article and I, I actually took it years later and dissected it and said, here's why this is not good. Like here's here. Like I was getting, I was getting the attention from the people who agreed with me and I was getting that, the, yeah. that applause, but the people that I was trying to like move forward, I actually pushed away. Right. And so like, mm. that's one of the things I love about um, having access to, you know, to my own blog is I could see like, Hey, like, what did I used to think on this? Like, what has changed for me? Like, what, what are some of these things doing? And, and like, just kind of an interesting thing. Cause I, w I wish I would see that more in schools where it wasn't like someone would go into an English class, do all the writing goes on paper, and then they never refer back to it again. Like, how do we see our own growth? And it's like, how do you do right. that? How do you do that in your, how do you do that in your own classrooms? Like, is there ways that we can do that as teachers in our classrooms where we could kind of like go back and look at our own progression. And, and what we do. Yeah. 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 Um, one of the things that I, I just instituted recently is, um, you know, our, our district has, has been kind of flexing a little bit on, do we hold kids accountable to due dates or do we penalize them if things come in late or do we let them rewrite, redo? Um, and I just found that giving them a really, really like clear guidelines makes a difference. And so I've started this deal where if they turn it in on time, um, they have an entire week to make any corrections or right. changes based on my feedback to improve their grade without any kind of penalty at all. It's just mm -hmm. a complete replacement grade. And if they don't turn it in on time, uh, they forfeit that opportunity. Hmm. Um, and so it has really driven, um, I, I just surveyed my kids at the end of term three, about two weeks ago, um, ask them to give advice to the incoming fourth term kids. And th the overwhelming um, hmm. advice was turn things in on time, right. take advantage, take advantage of the feedback and the opportunity to fix things. Um, and, and I don't know that I would have seen that in a prior class if I didn't have that policy. Um, they need a little bit of an incentive to want to do it, but um, otherwise they were just kind of turning stuff in that was just for me to read and mm -hmm. you know that doesn't really help them but if they're turning in a resume that they're actually right. going to potentially use um getting a b on it for me what good does that do them but turning it in getting a b and then making all the changes right. and turning it into an a that might actually help them somewhere down the line so i, I want them to to make the changes to improve because that's the whole goal is that everybody is at the A level when mm -hmm. they're done with my class because they've mastered what I had to share with them. And, um, and your, pro your process, so I, I've used this analogy before, right? So like, let's say you're a band teacher, right? Mm -hmm. And like, shout out to all the band teachers. Like if you, like hearing a kid play the clarinet for the first time must be the most horrible thing ever, right? Like that would suck. <laughs> and And so, you know, like, 
by the end of your time with those kids, you should want to be able just to sit back and listen. Like you got them to Mm -hmm. a point where you actually want to listen to them. And it's like, but we then using that same analogy for like English teachers, I'm sure, you know, at a point you're Mm -hmm. like, oh, this is terrible. Like, this is just right. And then what you're doing is getting Mm -hmm. them to the point where like, yeah, I would actually read this. Like, hey, this resume is is like a kid. And I think that's part of the process is that we're taking these kids from a place where it's like, yeah, of course they're not like, you know, if you gave me a clarinet, it's not like just kids, you gave me a clarinet right now, it would be, this would be no mm-hmm. one would listen to this podcast and nobody listens as it is right now. But you know, clarinet, would, maybe, <laughs> maybe that would draw some viewers, but you want to get kids to that point. But if you don't right. actually kind of build that feedback and, and connect it. So I, I, I really love that you you're sharing that. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about your book, Capturing the Classroom. And you kind of alluded to it um, in our conversation before we, we started recording the podcast and just kind of like how beneficial it would be to right now, but how it was beneficial before. So can you kind of just give us like a, and it's coming out, I think July, 2021 is when it's released from uh, Solution Correct. Tree. Uh, it's available mm-hmm. for pre-order right now. And so you actually, if you look in the description below, um, you get more information on Ellen's book, but can you just give us a little synopsis of the book um, and, and like, and I'm sure it's not, is it, it's not just for English teachers, is it? It'd be for like, no. for anybody yeah. K-12 basically. Right. Yeah. So right. T- tell us about yeah. the book. So the book is really a how to, but I think it's more of a why to, uh, to use video in your classroom to actually, um, basically improve teaching and learning. Mm-hmm. Um, my, my company is called The Duplicator um, because it's founded on this principle that when you do video, um, you basically cheat time. You a- you're, you enable yourself to actually have more time to do other things mm-hmm. when you're when you're leaning on on video in certain certain aspects. So, for example, um, you know, if I'm teaching the same class twice in one day, um, the first class period I might be fully engaged and record the whole thing. If it's mm-hmm. a class, to, you know, if it's a lecture for me. Um, but the second time around, there's not really any reason for me to deliver that again. Mm-hmm. And I really kind of I fought the the guilt on this for a long time hmm. until I really saw, did the research and found out what the benefits are. But showing that video to the second class period, not every time or every day, mm-hmm. but occasionally that allows me the opportunity to maybe be sitting in the back and grading and really giving them some good feedback on papers that I wouldn't necessarily have the time to provide that kind of feedback Mm -hmm. if I didn't have that extra hour in my day. Um, Or maybe it allows me to walk through the classroom and kind of see what people are doing while I'm actually teaching on the smart board on the recording. Um, I can give more instantaneous feedback where I'm not going to stop a lecture and say, hey, could you, you know, right put your phone away. I mean, I might ask them to put their phone away, but you know, if they seem kind of, you know, right, right, I can right. maybe just tap them on the shoulder and kind of give them a reminder of what's happening. Um, I can be more engaged with them as learners if I take advantage of some video time. Um, so that's just one application. There are so many others that, that this book involves. Um, but so I, I've been doing this for quite a while and I've got recordings which obviously I'm not going to play recording every single day right. and sit in the back of the room and just, you know, have them play it out. Um, but there are times when it really does really, really comes in, in handy. Um, so uh, a few weeks ago, my father passed away and I found myself, um, you know, not able to go in to teach mm-hmm. for, yeah. it, it was the last two weeks of the term. I missed one week because I was dealing with, you know, the funeral. And then the second week, my husband actually contracted COVID on the day after the funeral. So then I was quarantined. So the last two weeks of a nine week class, I was at home. Mm -hmm. And so the first week I didn't tune in at all. I was dealing with funeral stuff. Second week, I was able to zoom in. Um, But having a video archive for my class Mm -hmm. that they could actually watch a classroom recording with different students, you know, from a prior term, they could watch a recording of me leading them through reading a Shakespeare play, take the quizzes that I already had set up on Canvas Mm -hmm. uh, to show their reading comprehension, right, and to have the benefit of me on a recording, and then be able to tap into emailing me questions, that sort of thing, if if necessary. it was just an absolute 
saving grace. Because mm-hmm. um, I think about when these types of things have happened in the past with uh, with colleagues, right. we'd step in. You know, here's a here's a filler unit that we can do, and let me grade those papers for you. And you know, all those things are wonderful, but I didn't need to tap into that from my colleagues at the end of their term when they were busy mm-hmm. <laughs> had things mm-hmm. to do. Um, so I definitely benefited from having the system in place in the last two weeks of my term. Um, and I know there are, there are a million other applications in different subject areas and different grade levels as well. Well, first of all, I'm sorry about your father passing away. So I didn't know that before. So I appreciate you sharing that with, with all of us. Um, when I'm, when I'm listening to you and thinking about how you would show video and you would be in the class while students were watching video. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. So I think about that. um, It's kind of like, and everyone who listens to this podcast knows I'm really into sports. It's, it's kind of like a coach watching tape with, with a team and then having the ability to like pause and say like, Hey, let's like, let's talk Mm -hmm. about this too. Right. And it's kind of, you know, it's kind of going through that play by play which is like a really interesting way to think about it. Now, obviously there's benefits for like self-paced learning where students, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm sure that was beneficial, but you were, you were doing this like before COVID. It wasn't like, this is something that you're just starting right now. So like for anyone, let's say like if if anyone who is interested in this idea and wants to do this, like what would, what would be like, what would be, cause I know a lot of people are very, and understandably so like, I, I don't ever watch myself on video. And because mm-hmm. I, I get anxiety about it. I do. I, it's yeah. weird. And I've actually had some of my like, it, weirdly enough, I don't know why um, I, on YouTube, I've had like some past keynotes, like you should watch this keynote. I'm like, that's me. And I like, will watch it. I'm like, I can't do this. Like, I, I can't see myself. Right. Cause I'm <laughs> cause like part of it is you're like, there's probably that anxiety of analyzing yourself too much. Right. And mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. going through every um and ah and things like that. Um, so it was like, which I just said, um, to, you know, after I was complaining about ums and ahs. So, so like you kind of see that process. So like, if you are new to this and you want to try this out, what would be like a first step for somebody who wants to do this? Um, you know, there's so many different ways that you can do it. Mm -hmm. Um, and to be honest, you don't even necessarily have to record yourself. Right. There are ways to create a tutorial where you are only recording your screen and it's just your voice mm-hmm. talking kids through something like through a, a lecture or presentation that you want them to watch. Um, you know, the, the one thing that I always tell people is, is that it's free. You can record, mm-hmm. you can re-record. You don't, you know, if you don't like it, don't use it. it it's yeah. not that big of a deal. Um, and the other thing, I think the probably the biggest message is that whatever it is that you're recording to share with students, the whole goal is to make learning better. Mm -hmm. right? To make it easier, to make it more direct, to deliver it on their terms, on their timeline. Um, They're not watching your videos to critique the way you look or Mm -hmm. um, your speech patterns. Like they're they're literally watching because they need to learn something. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you can keep in mind that the video is not about you personally, it's about the content that you have to deliver. Um, I think that takes some of the pressure off, right? Like, I really just need them to know this information about how to prepare for the test tomorrow, Mm -hmm. right? I don't care what, I mean, obviously you're not going to like roll out of your bed in your pajamas and do a video, but, you know, they're not going to critique my appearance any more than any normal day in the classroom. So um, I would say, you know, kind of try to put that out of your head. And then if it really bugs you, just do a recording without video and mm-hmm. just have a screencast. You know, what is, I can't remember. There's like this term. It's like, uh, oh, sorry, sage on the stage, right? Like you have the sage on the stage or the guide on the side. And I actually wrote about this um, that because people say like, oh, you shouldn't be the sage on the stage anymore. You should be the guy on the side. I'm like, no, you actually have to be all of those things. You just have to figure out when. It's not like if you're the sage on the stage, you're like a horrible teacher. If you're like lecturing kids, I, I lecture through keynotes. Like that's one way that I actually make a living and people really appreciate it. Now I do workshops, things like that and connect, but it's kind of interesting to think about how you're, you are like the sage on the stage and the guide at the side at the exact same time. 
right? Like it's, it's like, mm-hmm. it's kind of an interesting, mm-hmm. cause it's like, that's something that technology is now allowing us to do is actually say like, Hey, we can, right. we can do, we can actually be multiple things and get, like, how does that benefit our kids? Right. And you can like right. pause and things like that too. So if, yeah. if anyone's like listening for, and they're still maybe like in a remote learning situation or a hybrid situation, mm-hmm. um, is there like, like I'm, this is kind of obvious, but just kind of want your thoughts. How, how is this benefit to do this? Oh gosh, there's so many different mm-hmm. ways. Um, so I, one of my favorite things to do is the five minute tutorial. And I intentionally record on uh, Screencastify, which has a five minute limit for the free version. Yeah. And yeah. Um, something about the five minute limit makes kids and parents totally. actually watch. Mm-hmm. <laughs> if totally. you label it yeah. a five minute video, they're like, yeah. oh, okay, well maybe I'll re- watch this instead of trying to figure it out on my own. Um, so I love those and blasting those out to parents and like for clubs, especially if you got updates, if you've got things that are like timely relevant that you want kids to know and the parents to be on board, um, the five minute video is awesome. Um, for other, other ways with the, with the hybrid learning situation, I'm in a hybrid situation right now where I have, um, I have about 25% of my kids are virtual and, and 75% are face to face. Um, and I run my class exactly the way, well, not exactly the way, obviously you have to make some adjustments, but basically the way that I, I kind of always have, um, I'm including those virtual learners as, as we go. Now there's obviously there's internet issues, there are connectivity things, um, you know, the things that happen with, with schedules where kids can't tune in on the class. Uh, but if you have a recording of it, um, typically what I'll do is I'll record one block of the day. And then for the second block. Um, I might record segments of it. And so then when I, I post it all, I put it on my week at a glance and here's the full Zoom recording for today. And here's the segments of mm-hmm. you know me reading and then here's the discussion. So you can tap into whatever you need. I'm not sure if I'm answering your question fully here. No, kind of that's great. Going off on a tangent, but <laughs> there's just, there's so many applications. Um, and like what you, what you mentioned about the self-paced, kids for review, like right. even kids that were sitting in class can go back and re-listen to chapter one. And, you know, I talked to them today about how there's different contexts for reading. Like some, if you're reading A Tale of Two Cities for the first time, you're not going to crank up the pace as fast as it can go, right? You're going to mm-hmm. like try to let that sink in and enjoy it. But if it's review purposes the day before the test, yeah. you can go back to that recording and speed it up and just refresh all that stuff in there. Um, and so my daughter actually was, was one of my big inspirations for this. She had a concussion when she was, um, I think she was a freshman in high school mm-hmm. and she, or maybe a sophomore, I don't know. Anyway, she, um, oh, could only do half days and, um, really, really was, was pretty seriously impaired for a while. Um, and on spring break, she's sitting in the back of the car and she's got her headphones in, just kind of spacing out. And I'm like, you know, hey, what are you listening to? She's like, I'm, I'm studying for my um, my AP test that's coming up. Hmm. Like, what? You know, like what? She's like, yeah, she recorded the professor, the teacher, um, the lectures in class. She, she hid her phone in her backpack <laughs> and recorded the lectures because she couldn't right. remember anything. Her short-term memory right. was just shot. Right. Um, but when her brain was recovered, um, so she must've been at least a sophomore when this happened. Um, when her brain was recovered enough, she, you know, she's listening to these, these lectures Mm -hmm. and just, you know, like putting that all back into the brain. Um, so it's the teacher didn't have to spend review time with her to get her Mm -hmm. all ready for the, the exam because she had all those recordings that she could tap into and kind of take some ownership of her own learning by using the actual teacher's instruction. That's awesome. That's, and that's, and I, I love, I love stories like that, that, you know, inspire, you know, inspire by our kids. So that's awesome. So if anyone's actually interested in, uh, t- there's a link in the description to capturing the classroom. Like I said, it's going to be available, uh, in July, 2021. I, I know I'm going to ask you one last question because I know a lot of people that are listening and a lot of people in my audience, maybe at one point, maybe want to write a book and want to go through this. So I know that you said you were a freelance writer for a while, right? So is this mm-hmm. your, is this your first book that you've published? Like sort of, <laughs> okay. How is it? Um, I'm curious. Uh, 
<laughs> there's a lot of different ways to get published, right. I guess. Um, so so I did actually write a children's book that I self-published. Okay, um, gotcha. Which really kind of went nowhere. But if you Google me, you'll see it. Right, right, right. Um, And then I also, when I was doing freelance writing, um, I did it for educational companies. So I, I think I have two books that actually- Like ghostwriting? I, I wrote. Um, no, I, well, I wrote the whole thing and I do have the, my name on the okay. actual books. Um, but it was a, you know, work for hire situation. So it was nice of them to give me my gotcha. actual name on the book, right. but uh, you know, somebody else told me what to write. And then I, you know, I did that. That's very cool. <laughs> so, so, Hey, so like for anyone listening, like if they ever wanted to write a book, like what advice would you give them to start? Uh, well, you know, the first thing is really just to have a, a great idea. Mm-hmm. I mean, you have to be truly inspired by something um, to just say, I want to write a book. I mean, you, you kind of have right. to have something that's going to be of value and um, you have to know the market of what else is out there mm-hmm. that relates to this in any kind of way. Um, and then just, you know, making a proposal and, and catching a, a produce, a, you know, a, a company that's willing to a publisher that's willing to take a gamble on you. Yeah. I guess that's the biggest yeah. thing. Um, but I think that spark of, of a good idea is really the, the most important aspect. Yeah. And I so appreciate that advice because I have connected with a lot of people and they'll say like, I want to write a book. I'm like, okay, so what do you want to write a book on? I don't know. I just want to write a book. I'm like, that's not how it goes. Right. Like it took me, yeah. it took me years of writing just short articles um, before the innovators mindset came out. And it wasn't like it just one day I had an idea. It was like, oh, like mm-hmm. I can kind of look back and see these things. Right. So I think it's like, mm-hmm. find what you're passionate about, as you said. And then, and then start to put that in a book format. Don't say like, I want to write a book because like, I, I believe this too. And I don't want to be condescending to anybody. I really believe anybody could write a book right now, but to write a good mm-hmm. book is a totally different thing, right? Cause like you can self publish, you can do those things. And I'm not trying to discourage anybody, but you know, just simply saying, I want to write a book. It's to me, like, I think people don't even look at their own ideas and try to figure out like, how do I get this out there? How do I make this compelling? But they just kind of mm-hmm. maybe want that little check mark. So I appreciate you kind of sharing that, but right. So, and especially well, and yeah, go the, ahead. the other aspect of, of writing it. Um, I think a lot of times people think they're going to sit down and write the book and then they're going to like send it off and somebody's going to publish it. Right. Like that has not been my experience. Right, right. <laughs> like I sent off a proposal and then they said, okay, we want this much more of what this proposal should look like. And so that was a whole process. Right. Um, it, it, it's, it's very much a process. Um, and uh, the original proposal has the core idea yeah. in it, but it looks very, very different from what my original proposal looked like now. So um yeah, it's. <laughs> I would say yeah. if you're glued to the idea that I I wrote this book and it's done and I want somebody to publish it, right? You should probably just self-publish it because you're probably right. not going to find right. a publisher that says, "Awesome, this is good as is. Let's go." Yeah, well, it's funny actually. So I wrote, um, I wrote a little bit of Innovator's Mindset. I wrote that first, and I had a proposal, um, given to somebody, and I, I just want this. I I want to make this loud and clear for people. So somebody took it and said, "No, we don't like it." We want you to write it like this. We want you to write it like this. I'm like, that's not me. That's not how I want to write. And mm-hmm. I waited until I could write the book I wanted. And I, I would rather have not written a book than write a book that I didn't want, mm-hmm. that I wouldn't want to read. And that's what right. that's what one publisher was asking me to. They really wanted me to write for them, but they wanted me to write their way, not write the way that I built my audience and the way that I connected with people. So I, mm-hmm. I held off for a couple of years until I found the right publisher. Uh, shout out to like Dave Burgess, um, just, you know, letting me write. And so we have our own publishing company and we, we encourage people and say like, Hey, like when we're honest with that saying like, Hey, this book's not for us, but it's going to be for somebody. But like, we want mm-hmm. you to hold true to your voice. Like that is right. really, really important. We don't want to tell you how to write, but, we also have like certain guidelines, certain things that we're looking for. And there's probably maybe other publishers too. So like, don't be discouraged if um, somebody 
doesn't want the book the way that you write it, just be patient with that. And I think, you know, it's, it's, it's well worth the wait for me, but Ellen, it's, it's, uh, mm-hmm. it's, um, it's been awesome to talk to you and I feel way less guilty about watching Shakespeare. So good. good. So, so I knew I was right about that the whole time. Right. So anytime <laughs> anybody like gives me that, I'm like, Ellen said that it's Shakespeare's right. for watching, not for reading. So and I'm just going to, yep, even though exactly. that's not exactly what you said, that's how I'm going to say it. So I can get away <laughs> with it. But Ellen, okay. thanks. And uh, make sure that everyone uh, check out her book, Capturing the Classroom. And uh, thanks for being on the episode. And I, I, I look forward to chatting again. Great. Thank you so much for having me. Bye everyone.